How many are ready for God's word this morning? Come on, you ready for God's word? James chapter 1, here's our passage for today. It says this, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I've entitled my message this morning, Doers, Not Hearers. That we would be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. If you like my notes, you can text notes to somewhere on the screen and uh, what's in front of me will be sent to you. Let's pray this morning. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak through his word today. Holy Spirit, we're here in this place and we only want to hear from you. Lord, I pray as we open your word, your logos word, your written word, that it become alive in us. For Lord, your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, I humble myself right now, Jesus. Lord, help us to go low this morning, to be able to receive this word from you. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in this house, in this church. And God, we will give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Not a man or a person, but just you, God. That is why we are here. And so God, as we often pray, God, I pray that you'd speak this morning, for we are your servants and we are listening. And everyone said in this place this morning, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Wesley, appreciate you. By the way, can you just think, Wesley, this is actually his last Sunday He's military and is going to be uh, going to Japan. Can you just thank him for his, for his gift he's given us this morning? Love you, brother. You know, as a parent, I'll often ask my kids, I'll say to them, something to do. And they'll reply back sometimes, why? Has anybody ever done that before with your kids? You ask them to do something and they'll immediately say, why? Now my kids, now that they're a little bit older, they don't ask that question nearly as often. But I'll ask them to do something and then come to find out, well, they don't do it. They're great kids, but sometimes we're, you know, we're all wondering uh, what is going on with all that? Did you not hear me? Uh, did I say it not clearly? Like, did I not make myself clear? We've all been there. I've been there when I was a kid, we, right? Uh, this past uh, Friday, I took my son uh, out to, uh, to hit some golf balls. We went to a place that's like Top Golf in Fleming Island, and um, I was teaching him, you know, how to swing a golf club. He got golf clubs for his birthday. So I was showing him, okay, okay Caleb, I, you grip the golf club like this, and you want the ball uh, in this place in your stance, and it's more of a sweeping motion than it is swinging like a, a baseball bat. And so I'm showing him all of these things on how to hit a golf ball. And before I know it, you know, just maybe two swings later, 
He's got his grip this way, right, and the ball's way back in his stance this way, and he's swinging and he's trying to hit the ball like a baseball instead of like a golf ball. And so I keep on explaining it to him over and over and over again, and I'm like, man, why do you keep on going back to that type of grip and all these other things? And he just kind of says to me, well, Dad, I just feel more comfortable hitting it like this, you know? And I'm like, well, in the long run, it's not going to be as good for you, and I just encourage him, like, hey... Have the, right, uh, have the right way of doing it. Because how many know fundamentals are very, very important when it comes to anything in life? And I was like, hey, get the fundamentals down, do it the right way, and you'll be happy in the long term, even though right now it might feel uncomfortable. Aren't we often like this with God? Like God says to be a doer of the word, he tells us to do something, but we're like, I, I don't know, God. That doesn't really feel comfortable to me. I don't really want to do it that way. I don't feel like that's the right way of doing it when all along, if we were mature, we recognized and understood that, man, God has our best interest in mind. We'd be like, okay, God, whatever you say, because your ways are higher, your thoughts are greater. I just want to be a doer of the word, not just a year. You know, immature, immaturity, as far as Christianity comes, it's often asking God the question, why? You know what I'm saying? We ask God why or we just don't follow through with it. And then we're wondering, Lord, what is going on in my life right now? And James here, he gives us kind of insight on how to be a doer of the word. In verse 19, uh, he says this, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, right? Right? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. So we think when we read that, that it refers to our earthly relationships. And well, that's really good advice for earthly relationships, no doubt about it. But what I believe James, and I want to submit to you this morning, is talking about, he's more talking about our relationship with the Lord. That when we get before God, we would be quick to hear his word. We would be slow to speak, slow to speak to anger. You might be saying, Adam, how am I going to be slow to anger when it comes to God? How am I going to be slow to speak? Well, I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I get before the Lord, I'm spending time with him, I find myself just talking a whole lot. Anybody else been there before? And I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and I don't just sit back for a moment and try to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Quick to hear slow to speak, slow to anger. And I think to myself in my own personal life that when God has spoken to me, told me to do something, sometimes I don't really like it. You know what I mean? You ever been there before? I don't really like what the Lord is telling me. And so I'm like, okay, that's not for me, God. That's not really me. And we make excuses. Well, maybe that's just something I ate and that's not really what he's saying to me right now. And then we get to a point and we're thinking, okay, God, I wish you'd just give me direction. Lord, why aren't you speaking to me right now? Lord, you feel so silent when God already spoke to you. You just haven't done it yet. And he's saying, don't you know I've already told you what to do, but you haven't done it. And so maybe you need to reevaluate things in your own life. What are things that God has told you to do that you haven't done? I submit to you maybe this morning the reason why it might feel like he's silent is because you haven't been obedient to what he's already asked you to do. And so James is saying be a, not just a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. That we would be a people who don't just go through religious motions, who just say the right things and know the right things, but then don't put our faith into action. James is all about just putting our faith into action. That we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word. Say, I'm gonna be a doer of the word of God. May we be doers, not just hearers of the word. So then in verse 21, he gives us more of how to be a doer of the word. Let's read verse 19 through uh, 22, it says this, 
Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away, say put away. Put Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So verse 21 here, he gives us three things. What are the three things? Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. In other words, we should be holy. We should live lives of holiness. The second thing he gives us, and receive with meekness the implanted word. That we would walk humbly before the Lord, right? What's the third thing he says? Which is able to save your souls. That we would have this fear of the Lord. So three things this morning, let's talk about it, that I want to give you. To be a doer, walk in holiness. To be a doer of the word of God, walk in holiness. Verse 21, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Holiness. What is holiness? It is to put away everything that is not of God. It's to turn from our sin, turn from our wicked ways, turn from the things of this world, and stop playing with sin, stop flirting with sin, and stop making excuses. By definition, holiness means this. It means to be set apart, to be completely and totally his. How many of you want to be set apart and be completely and totally God's? Hebrews 12, 14 says this, pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue holiness. If you don't, you won't see the Lord. Pursue, the definition means this. It means to chase after with the intent to apprehend. So what are we chasing after? We're chasing after the behavior that lines up with our salvation because now we are new creations in Christ. The old is passed away and now we are new. We are made new in him and so we're going after the behavior that lines up with our identity in Christ. You see, Christians, they should look different. They should act different. They should speak different. We should be noticeably different than the things of this world. But far too often, we try to make things about us, about what we want to do, about what we think it should look like in our lives, that we would just pursue God and be a doer of the word. The second thing I want to give you is this. To be a doer of the word, walk in humility. Walk in humility. You've got to walk in humility, be a doer of the word of God. Back to verse 21. Therefore, receive with meekness the implanted word. You cannot receive from God without a humble and contrite spirit. Humility, though, it's not being passive and thinking less of yourself. I love what C.S. Lewis says about humility. He puts it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'm going to read that again because I want you to get it. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. You know, it says in Numbers that Moses was the most humble man who walked the planet. Who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. He says about himself as the inspired word of God, Moses, the most humble man who walked the planet. You see, it's not denying about who you are in Christ. It's realizing that without him, you are nothing. It's not saying, man, I can't walk in power in the might of the spirit of God. You know, oftentimes what ends up happening, those who aren't spiritually mature will then look at someone else who's walking in the power and the might of the spirit of God and accuse them of pride when all it is is them realizing that they are nothing without God and the spirit of God is within them. 
It's having this boldness and awareness that, man, I am nothing without the Lord. And so, man, I'm going to lean into God and allow his spirit to move and to work in and through me. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. Now, we'll be a people who go low. Who's the object of your affection? Who's the one you look after? Is it God? Is it his strength? Is it knowing who he is? Or is it yourself? Oftentimes I find myself when I'm gone through a difficult moment, difficult situation, as I begin to lean on my own strength. Anybody else ever been there before? You begin to lean on your own strength because you're like, oh man, the world's falling apart, my, my world is crashing down. When really what you need to do is recognize that, man, I just need to go before the Lord. I need to lean on him. And in that trial, as we talked about in week one, he is making me more like him. He's refining me through the testing. He's purifying my heart. And you're going before the Lord and you're just saying, God, you've got this, not me. Far too often we try to grab a hold of it and make it happen on our own. When humility is just, Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm looking just to you, Jesus. I mean, we, don't we often say that? And we know the right things to say, but our actions really do speak otherwise so often. I know it's the case in my life. May we go low. May we humble ourselves before the almighty God. You know, the level and degree that we can successfully submit to God is the degree that we are able to successfully navigate the attacks of the enemy. I'm going to say that one more time so you get it. To the degree we can successfully submit to God is the degree that we are able to successfully navigate the attacks of the enemy. I'm here to tell you this morning that the enemy, he is trying to take you out. He's after you. He's coming after you to steal, kill, and destroy. We are in a spiritual battle. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you cannot fight it on your own. You've got to have the spirit of God inside of you and recognize that, man, I cannot fight this on my own. I've got to have the Lord who lives inside of me come and bring the victory through him. It's not by my own might. It's not by my own power, but it's by the spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. So we will humble ourselves before the Lord. And through humbling ourselves before the Lord, through going low, God will bring the victory. The third thing to be a doer of the word is this. To be a doer, walk with the fear of the Lord. To be a doer of the word of God, you've got to have a view of God and the fear of the Lord within you. James 1.21 says this, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. In other words, do not, if you do not come with humility, if you do not come with holiness, which is this lifelong pursuit, holiness is a lifelong pursuit in which you will never grasp hold of in this life, but it's something that you must pursue If you don't pursue it, then your soul is in danger. You may say, Adam, man, it's grace. I've got the grace of God over my life. It's okay, I can live and do what I wanna do. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you view life like that and you're not going after turning from sin, I love you enough to tell you, I'm scared for your soul. I am literally scared for your soul. In order to understand grace and what grace really is, you've got to first understand the fear of the Lord. To really grasp God's grace and his love, you really do have to grasp the fear of the Lord. There's a very sobering uh, passage of scripture in Matthew 7. And it says this, I know this is heavy this morning now. (laughs) Y'all okay out there? 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? He who what? Does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and what? And does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built a house on the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Listen, when you go through trials, when you go through circumstances, as we've talked about, when we've gone through James, if you do the word of God, you're building your house on the rock, and you're going to have victory through that trial through that circumstance. But if you do not do what the word of God says, man, verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. How about you? But when I read this passage of scripture, it brings me to my knees. It should put the fear of God in you. That there are people in this room, even right now, who are saying, Lord, Lord, and they're at risk for God one day, when you stand before him, to say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's incredibly sobering, and I pray that you don't fool yourself and get caught when you stand before the Lord one day, because make no mistake about it, every one of us will stand before God one day. And you hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you. In Isaiah it says that the fear of the Lord is his treasure. The fear of the Lord is your treasure. It says in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Man, if you can grasp the fear of God, it's like one of the most fundamental things in our walk with the Lord. If you can grasp that it is your treasure, like it's your highest prize. Far too often, we've negated this and we've tried to look at the word of God, we try to fit the word of God and make it about us and when God is saying, have you rightly divided the word? Because you can find almost any argument to make it fit your lifestyle. I want to make it fit my lifestyle. I can go and I can sin and I can do this while I'm under grace. No, 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 no. You got to rightly divide the word of God. In other words, you got to say, who is writing this? Who is he writing it to? What is going on in that culture for that day, in that time, in that season? And you've got to apply it to your life appropriately. You've got to rightly divide the word of God in your life. It's so incredibly important to do so. Don't be looking through it through the lens of you're the hero. You're not the hero. I'm guilty of that sometimes. I'll read and I'm like, oh, I'm the hero in all this. God's going to get me victory. He's going to come through. And yes, he is. But oftentimes we look at it in a way of saying, man, I'm the hero in all of this. You're not the hero. Who's the hero? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hero. Not ourselves. You got to recognize, man, he is Lord of my life. You gotta make him completely Lord of your life in every single area, not just the areas that you want to, but every single area, may God be the Lord of your life. You can see this time and time again where Israel, they go through this cycle. It just feels like it's never ending in the Old Testament. They have this understanding of the fear of the Lord. And they do what the word of God is saying. And then one generation later, they forget it and they start doing what they want to do. One of these instances I want to share a story with you is in 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. 
You see, if we're not careful, what we will do is we'll find ourselves firing the chief leadership of Jesus in our life only to take over and make matters in our own hands and make it worse. Israel, they did this time and time again. And the rebellion of our age and our culture today is no different than what it was 3,000 years ago. So a king over Israel, Hezekiah, he's about to be overtaken by the Assyrian Empire. It's a great example of what it looks like when a people a region, a nation, decide, I don't want to do the will of God anymore. But Hezekiah, he's a man who humbles himself and he prays. Look what happens. 2 Kings 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. I just want to help you for a moment. That's not a prophetic word that you want to get from nobody. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to hear that prophetic word. You need your house in order because you're going to die. You don't receive that from. But Hezekiah, he has this view of God. Hezekiah, he has this fear of the Lord within him. And you can see this in the previous chapter. He prays this. Incredible prayer, prayer, and he says this, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Hezekiah has this view of the supreme authority of God. So with that, look at verse two now. Then he turned his face towards the wall And he prayed to the Lord saying, remember now, O Lord, I pray, how have I, how how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle of the court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will tell you, on the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and it will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you in the city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Let me just paint this picture for you this morning. Hezekiah, he's not a great king, but he's not a bad king either. He's sick. He gets a word from Isaiah from the Lord. Says, get your house in order. Get things in order because you're going to die. Hezekiah's response with his fear of the Lord is, I mean, if there's a God who heals, if there's a God who saves, if there's a God who delivers, I'm going to turn my face towards this wall and I'm going to pray and weep and cry out to God. So what does God do? He honors his prayer. Isaiah, before he hits the courtyard, he's tapped on the shoulder by the Lord. He says, go back, tell him he's going to have 15 more years. Not only that, but I'm going to deliver him from the Assyrian Empire who's about to attack him. You see, Hezekiah didn't resolve himself and go on Facebook and make a post, oh no, I'm about to die. No, what he did is he said, I'm going to put my head against this wall and I'm going to pray. I'm going to cry out to God, who's my deliverer, who's my strength, who's my shield. He didn't agree with what he was receiving from Isaiah. Although it was from God, what did he do? He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. What if a people came together on a Wednesday night and they prayed? What if a people came together on a Thursday night and began to intercede and stand in the gap and pray? What if we came on a Friday night at seven o'clock and prayed? What if we came in this place on a Saturday at 6.30 for encounter and began to pray? What if we had someone in this room every single hour praying and interceding for our nation because I know what everybody's saying about our nation 
I know what they're saying. I know what the weather report says. I know what the news is saying. Yeah, it doesn't look good. But what if a people of God gather together and begin to pray? What if we receive what the word of the Lord says and says, I do not receive that? What if it's a call to pray? What if a church arose and awakened their hearts and stirred their hearts for God once again? Judgment is thus starting the house of God, but so does the winds of revival. So does the fire of God. So does the glory of God. And I believe that God can pour out his spirit on this nation once again. He can do it if we pray. Come on, if we pray. If we would be a people who stand in the gap, who do not settle, and we just pray. We would come before the Lord and realize, man, God, we repent of our ways. We turn to you. We humble ourselves before you. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. God is calling his church to arise once again and to pray. And in that, we're gonna see healing in our land, healing in our church. And God is gonna do something and there's gonna be a move of God across this nation, I believe. I know what the report says. May we receive that report and say, man, I'm going to pray. It's the greatest hour for the church. It is the greatest hour for the church, I believe. I want to end with this story. It's a story of a man who started in small beginnings and began to pray. It says this, the story... In the wake of Charles Finney's revival, a businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear got converted at Finney's Broadway Tabernacle in Manhattan, New York in 1842. After working in business for over 20 years at age 49, Jeremiah got hired as a local missionary by the North Dutch Church on Fulton Street. He traded his big salary for one that was less than $1,000 a year. Remember, it's 1842. God began to break Jeremiah's heart for the lost while he evangelized. May God, in this season of fasting and prayer, break our heart for the lost. He saw that there was a great need for God in those days. Then one day, God gave him an inspired idea on how to reach the people. He decided to host a Wednesday night prayer meeting from 12 p.m. Or I'm sorry, a Wednesday prayer meeting at lunchtime from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. He passed out flyer, uh, flyers and began to spread the word. He encouraged people to come for no matter how long they were able to, able to come, whether it was five minutes, 10 minutes, or more. He welcomed them all to come and engage in prayer with him. The date was set for prayer meeting to be at noon on September 23rd, 1857. When the day came, he was ready to welcome the others for a time of prayer. At noon, no one showed up. Then 12.10, still no one. At 12.25, still no one. Nearly halfway through his prayer, first prayer meeting, he may have felt like a failure or maybe that he had not heard God correctly. Who knows what may have been going through his mind after being vulnerable to follow what he felt was the leading of the Lord only to see the, that absolutely no one responded. He did not throw in the towel or give up quite yet. He stood his ground and remained. Then suddenly at 12.30, the first person joined him for prayer. Then another, until he had a total of six people, joined him the first day. That was enough for him to see there was a need for prayer and that God was on it. He did not despise the day of small beginnings, but learned, but leaned into what God was doing. They planned another prayer meeting for the following Wednesday. This time, 20 men came. Then the following 40, following week 40, he had, he had to move to a bigger room. Then on October 10th, 1857, the stock market crashed. People lost everything in a matter of moments. Desperation for God increased. May we not wait 
for a traumatic event to cause our desperation for God to increase. Soon these prayer meetings were not just weekly but daily. In a short time, there were crowds up to 3,000 people joining the Fulton Street prayer meeting. People from all different kinds of classes joined in. There were specific guidelines in place for this prayer meeting that worked well during that time. It started promptly at 12 p.m. and finished right at 1 p.m. They allowed people to come and go as they pleased so that it possible for everyone to join on their lunch break. The news of this prayer meeting spread, especially through the newspapers at that time. One of the six to attend the first meeting was a 21-year-old who had a passion to take the same fire for prayer to his hometown in Philadelphia. His first meeting had 40, then 60, then 300, then 2,500. Then he had to get a tent to accommodate the incoming crowds. In just four months, over 150,000 people had prayed in that tent. This revival was made up of people from all different denominations. It was a lay person's revival. This was a prayer meeting for souls. And within a year, it is estimated that over one million people got saved from this prayer meeting. What might happen again today when a few people set aside a little time to pray together for the lost, for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit again? Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Most revivals and powerful moves of God, they have swept the nation and started in a small prayer meeting. May we be a people who just receive the call and pray. Pray for our city. Pray for our nation. Pray for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God once again. Who wants that in their life? If you're with me, would you stand to your feet?